Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Today, let's go to Australia and talk about seaweed. How about it? I think this is going to be the most interesting. Look, I'm going to talk to a guy, Dr. Brian von Herzen, whom I had never heard of until a couple of weeks ago. When I came across some of his uh, videos, I was smitten. I tell you, I decided I, I wanted to see everything the man had ever produced on a video. So uh, I've got him today all to myself, and we're going to talk about seaweed because that's his thing. And I tell you, he's just about converted me. I am now an, a, an apostle of seaweed and I'm spending all my time writing about it and reading about it. And of course, the, the best thing today is I, I've been writing about things I don't know enough about so I can check some of my ideas against his. All right. Hi. So hi, Brian, how are you? Oh, fine, Meta. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's great to meet you and uh, discuss uh, regenerating life in the oceans, one hectare at a time with marine permaculture. Well, I tell you, your green screen looks absolutely like you're down in the tank with real fish and, and, and a real seaweed. Tell me, is that a brown seaweed or what kind of seaweed is behind you in that green screen? That is a giant kelp macrocystis, which is the canopy forming foundational species that creates the kelp forest from California to the tip of Tasmania. And it's a beautiful, iconic ecosystem. Sadly, we've lost 90% uh, of the kelp forest off Northern California and 95% of the kelp forest off Eastern Tasmania just in the last couple of decades. Okay. Well, anyway, um, I, I think that is your thing. Those are the kind that you are using for your um your adventure right well why actually, don't we just start at the top and you tell the whole world the wonderful thing that you're doing well there are fourteen thousand species of seaweed and those are red and green and uh, brown seaweeds and of those you know i think humanity's found a way to develop a couple dozen so we've barely touched the tip of the iceberg but there's a chance to regenerate kelp forests in temperate waters and tropical seaweed cultivations into in tropical waters and really reverse uh, a, a real challenge. And that is the water is getting warmer. More than 90 percent of all global warming is going into the oceans today. And it's causing there are multiple ecosystems from the kelp forests of Tasmania to the Great Barrier Reef to the seaweed forests of the Philippines and the um, the kelp forests on the west coast of the U.S. Those are all living within one dis one degree of mortality each summer, and Ooh. so when we warm the water by 1.1 to 1.3 degrees Celsius, we are literally putting these ecosystems on the brink, uh, and and uh, it is quite a brink, I must say, because one of the last times this happened was in the Permian mass extinction. Um, CO2 entered the atmosphere, the water got too warm, it stratified, we lost the natural upwelling. We lost the nitrate and the phosphate. We lost the um, kelp forests and the um, and and the algae forest, the plankton forests, if you will, and that resulted in deoxygenation um, and anoxia, hypoxia, a loss of ninety six percent of all marine species, and that was due to a introduction of carbon dioxide at around five gigatons per year of carbon, um, and now we're looking at thirteen gigatons of carbon and uh, nearly 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year um, by man. So we're doing something that's two and a half times stronger than what happened during the Permian mass extinction. Why would we do the same thing over and over again and expect different results? I mean, we have to really get serious about keeping our marine ecosystems on life support, feeding humanity, the more than a billion people depend on the oceans for their sustenance. And literally when we're growing and, and restoring the natural upwelling, and growing uh, seaweed cultivations offshore in deep water in the Western Pacific, we're seeing thousands of sardines, hundreds of tuna, dozens of dolphins, and even a whale shark voting with their fins and saying, you've got the good stuff. So I think we're on the right track towards regeneration of life in the ocean. Okay. Well, uh, it, um, I want you to tell us about these platform things that you're developing, because this this intrigues me enormously. You're talking about re restoring desert in the, in the ocean, apparently half of the the uh, uh, the Pacific Ocean is dead or something, and you want to tell us about it. Yes, well, I think David Attenborough said it well when he said it's mostly empty ocean, and between you and me right now, there's more than a hundred million square kilometers of mostly empty Pacific Ocean, 
And that ocean can be regenerated. Historically, in Australia and the US alone, we had 3,000 square kilometers more kelp forest than we do today. Because in the last few decades, we've lost 1,000 square kilometers off Western Australia, several hundred square kilometers off of Eastern Tasmania, and um, a true decimation, uh, two decimations actually off the West Coast of the US, including uh, in the 19, well, if we go back to the US geodetic survey maps from the 1800s, there was a continuous river of kelp, a half a kilometer wide, extending from central California to the Mexican border, as exemplified on the US geodetic survey maps of the 1800s. It was such a barrier that if you were on a ship and you wanted to go to Santa Barbara Harbor or Los Angeles, you had to cross this river of kelp and it was a navigational hazard. So it is important and crucial. And I think what's significant is the US Geodetic Survey did a great job of documenting what no one alive today has a living memory of the kelp forests that were in the 1800s. And this is something we need to document because we've lost uh, an order of magnitude just from that. And then in the last two decades alone, between the big warm blob and the El Nino and the warming that we've been uh, experiencing recently, uh, it has transformed I mean, it has resulted in a decimation of the canopy forming kelp forest in Northern California as well, extending all the way up to Vancouver Island in BC. So, so it's seen... all the heat that does it, it's nothing else. Well, the high temperatures um, provide create an energy barrier to upwelling. And so high temperatures correlate with less nutrients because the nutrients are down deep and you require those offshore winds to sweep that warm water offshore and bring the deep water up, which provides nutrients to the kelp forest and um, the plankton forests and the entire habitat, the entire ecosystem. Okay, now I think we, I was surprised to find out uh, that kelp grows in the Arctic and, and it apparently grows in Canadian waters that are, and in fact, I think they're doing fine, probably because the Canadian water is just that much cooler and uh, and, the, uh, and Hudson Bay, the kelp is going gangbusters. Yes, it is. And I'm going to be, um, I think we've got a great opportunity in places like Hudson Bay to enable that. This uh, is is one of those geode US geodetic survey maps from 1888. And it shows this continuous river of kelp past Santa Barbara Harbor, which is depicted here. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's no way to the harbor without crossing the kelp forest. So just an example of what things look like. And it is true, we've got examples of kelp forest from I would say temperate waters and uh, tropical waters alike. In fact, here's a picture of the kelp forest extent globally that includes major west coasts around the continents and all the way up even to Iceland and uh, northern parts of Norway and uh, the Siberian uh, Peninsula as well. So there's huge areas of, of kelp uh, around the world oceans. And where we don't see kelp, there's plenty of tropical seaweeds. In fact, I've recently heard about some algae that grows on the, on the underneath side of sea ice. And so literally the sea ice itself in the Arctic Ocean was providing a habitat for this uh, algae to grow under the sea ice and actually uh, photosynthesize and fix carbon and provide sustenance for Arctic species. So with no more sea ice, and sadly we've lost 80% of our sea ice, um, you know, we don't have that habitat, we don't have that substrate for the algae to grow in the Arctic Ocean. And that's an ongoing concern that is getting that is increasing in magnitude. I like to say that the Earth, the planet, is a bit like a glass of ice water. And if you have a glass of ice water and it's full of ice and you apply a lot of heat to it, you can melt most of the ice, but the ice water won't change temperature. It still be at zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, as soon as you melt the last ice cube, the temperature in the glass skyrockets with the application of heat. And so planet is like a glass of ice water and we're close to melting our last ice cube, which is the Arctic Ocean, which will become ice free in the next decade. And so our challenge and our opportunity is to uh, refill the ice, if you will, restore the ice to the Arctic and that can provide a habitat for those Arctic seaweeds, for example. Okay, I'm working on that with some people that you know, Stephen Salter and, uh, and Peter Wadhams. Uh, but that's that's a different uh, uh, issue. Uh, uh, let's come back to it later. But I I want uh, everybody to know about your uh, plan to put these platforms out there in the 
in the ocean and and uh, uh, bring us up uh, to speed on that yes we're scaling by a factor of 10 this year and then western pacific we are growing a, a tenth of a hectare of marine permaculture deep water irrigation that restores the natural upwelling of nutrients and provides a replete environment for seaweed to grow and the seaweed is growing 100 to 300 percent per month and it's approximately an order of magnitude greater than the controls that are only surface irrigated so we see a huge opportunity to do that uh, we've got we've secured with the help of the x prize for carbon removal which we won last quarter uh, we have two of the three million that we'll need in order to build an economically sustainable hectare which will be the model for economic sustainability of communities uh, along the coast from the western pacific across to the eastern pacific and around the world and we see one hectare at a time literally regenerating life in the ocean and staving off the permian mass extinction. do you have a photo of one of those platforms here yes i have okay. a couple of illustrations um this is actually a frame from an animation of uh a marine permaculture platform which has marine solar in the middle and a ring of uh seaweed around the outside okay, and what's, what's that blue thing I, that's the picture i saw as a yes. video but what is that that is a marine solar array, which is now uh, commercialized at technology readiness level nine, uh, which means that it's ready to go. Okay, now the donut shaped thing, what's, what goes on there? The donut is the ring for seaweed itself. And we put lines of seaweed uh, between the inner and outer rings, and uh -huh. that provides the replete environment for the seaweed to grow in a, an environment where it's got deep water irrigation, either through upwelling or deep cycling. And that means that uh, the seaweed has all the nitrate and phosphate it needs to grow 100% to 300% per month. Okay, now in the video, it showed streamers coming out from that outer ring um, as if they there were kelp um, things growing there too. Is that correct? Yes. The, the, here's an actual photograph from a drone of seaweed lines that are going from an inner ring to an outer ring. And these are seaweed lines and tube nets that um, are able to contain the seaweed and enable it to grow uh, as fast as it can and absorb sunlight during the day and absorb nutrients at night. Okay, now this thing doesn't really exist, right? Because it was no, such a realistic video, I thought it was live, but it, is, it, it's, a, it's an animation and not a real thing. Does it exist at all? Yes, it does. This is a 100 square meter photograph from a drone. Oh, I see. Two people swimming. You know, and this is a real seaweed platform growing today. And we're scaling this by a factor of 10 to a tenth of a hectare this year, which is about, you know, we're assembling and about to launch a much bigger platform. And that's just the beginning of getting to hectare scale, sustainable mariculture, which we expect to be the sustainable size so as we go this, forward. This circle will have, be the inner thing of a much larger circle, and all of it will be filled with seaweed, right? Yes, there are four phases here. We're in phase three right now, mm -hmm. and we're just presently designing and implementing phase four, which will be hectare scale uh, marine permaculture. And that's going to enable economic sustainability for coastal communities across the Pacific Ocean. Now, do you live there? I mean, is somebody going to be there all the time or do you just go away and, and let them grow until every now and then you come in and, and, and harvest them? Well, I've spent two years in the Philippines myself. We have a team on the ground that's doing the daily monitoring and uh, and growing and all that. The seaweeds are harvested on 45-day cycles, and so we can do up to eight harvests per year. And ultimately, we plan to automate these to the point where uh, you could visit one of these offshore platforms every 45 days, harvest and reseed, and monitor them remotely using satellite networks. Oh, so you don't even use people to do the harvesting? It, it's a machine? Well, the, the harvesting can be done on the 45-day visits, and so it can be done that way. Uh, so but every, effectively... every 45 days is about how long you would need to pick the things. Yes. I think you can effectively count on a new harvest every 45 days with this deep water irrigation system for tropical red seaweeds. Okay. Now, you you have a whole bunch of these you want to put all over the ocean. Uh, yes. And, and I assume you're not going to put them in shipping lanes where ships are going to bump into them. Uh, so you're going to put them in, in in places that are depleted of, of nutrients, right? Well, most of the subtropical oceans and the photozone are depleted of nutrients. And these marine permaculture platforms are not only shipping resilient, but also hurricane resilient. We have the only hurricane proven seaweed, moored seaweed platform on the planet presently. 
mm-hmm. having survived category five right. hurricane. That's uh, a hurricane aftermath that we're looking at now, huh? December. That's exactly in Cebu. That's where uh-huh. we got the super typhoon Rye. We experienced 120 knot winds and 16 or 17 foot seas. And those surprisingly, by lowering our platform just five meters below the surface, we were able to survive the waves and the wind with the platform in, not only intact, but most of the seaweed still on it. We were mm-hmm. growing seaweed the day after the hurricane. And in the last six months, we provided a quarter ton of seaweed uh, seedlings to our neighboring communities to enable their farms to get started again, as exemplified here in the lower right illustration. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's one okay, example. Now, now your notion is that this is, this is going to be... Uh, business. I, I mean, that there will pe- be people who will be able to set up these little farms and run them as like a cottage industry or even a, a an international corporate industry of some kind. But it'll be private uh, industry, private uh, um, economics, right? Well, yes. You know, the key to scaling um, is to enable small uh, industries, small businesses to thrive uh, across coastal communities. And this is so regenerative to the subsistence um, seaweed communities today. You know, these communities are underrepresented and underserved. And the opportunity is to really enable this kind of distributive technology to be applied so that this deep water irrigation can help to rescue their production of, of seaweed and fish for decades to come. It's a large market here in the in the Western Pacific. It's going to be $20 billion market for seaweed this this decade. And um, it's an opportunity to really uh, scale what we're doing and enable this to occur across the oceans and across the coastlines. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's I, I assume that you're hoping that it'll become a bigger market in the rest of the world, because I'm thinking of it as an, uh, a measure to reduce global warming. And uh, I think you want to talk a bit about how important um, seaweed is as a way of capturing, and and I and here's where we get into a conversation: sequestering carbon. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell us how that works. Yes, so we are primarily um, enabling this initially as a food security approach that also provides a high degree of biodiversity, and as we uh, grow these beautiful seaweed forest as exemplified in this illustration, um, we're generating that bounty and that fish habitat that really helps to regenerate fisheries. But it's little known fact that seaweed, uh, while some quarter of the seaweed falls off the platform during growth and sinks a thousand meters a day to uh, the abyssal ocean where it can remain for centuries uh, in the abyssal waters before those waters outcrop off the shores of Canada, for example. So that presents a true blue carbon sink. And so as we're uh, growing the seaweed here on our platform, we're also uh, catching the seaweed that's falling off the platform as every square meter, we can measure the flux of seaweed per square meter per day that's falling and sinking a thousand meters a day to the seafloor. And in a, a day or so, it's already gotten beyond this thousand meter depth horizon where it's stored for centuries, if not millennia. What's interesting is that the Uh, production, that seaweed that falls off during growth represents thousands of tons of carbon dioxide sunk to the deep ocean per square kilometer of marine permaculture per year. In addition, because we're making biostimulants that help agricultural crops, we can reduce nitrate fertilizer by 20%, and we can also reduce nitrous oxide by 20%. That enables perhaps 20 to 30,000 tons of carbon dioxide to be reduced and removed uh, and, uh, and avoided as a result of these interventions of seaweed that happens to sink to the seafloor while we're growing it on these deep water platforms. Beautiful. Okay. But now can you give us some numbers of how much you can count on how much CO2 reduction there can be from all these sources from say a square kilometer of, uh, of your uh, seaweed? Yes. Uh, the carbon removal is 8,000 tons of carbon dioxide per square kilometer per year. Uh, most of which can be sunk potentially to the deep sea, Uh, approximately 12,000 tons per square kilometer per year of avoided uh, fossil fuel uh, in order to produce uh, nitrate fertilizer, and ultimately close to 10,000 tons of avoided greenhouse gases in terms of the associated nitrous oxide emissions 
that uh, can be avoided by reducing the amount of nitrate fertilizer being applied to the land. Okay, I have two lines of uh, of conversation I want to pursue. The first is um, a a disquiet with the whole idea of having you sink the stuff to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, Half of me says, hooray, hooray, you're really uh, sequestering carbon. The other half of me uh, remembers uh, some other talk shows that I've done with uh, Peter Ward, uh, and and others who are concerned with uh, extinction phenomena. And you've already mentioned the Permian extinction phenomenon, which was the big one, I gather. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but uh, what he had to say was that, um, and I may be wrong about my uh, re- recollection. My recollection was that it had to do with the uh, stratification of the ocean. And when the bottom of the ocean gets uh, uh, deprived of oxygen and uh, something like seaweed or plankton or other things fall to the bottom of the ocean, they bring with them sulfur and can produce hydrogen sulfide. And a a short version of what happened in the uh, Permian extinction was that Uh, huge amounts of uh, hydrogen sulfide got emitted from the oceans all over the world and killed everything. Uh, There weren't any people around, but uh, plants and animals got eliminated. So um, there are two things that you mentioned. Uh, One is the stratification of the ocean and the upwelling, which I want you to explain a little bit more. (laughs) But but also... um, Aren't you doing the same thing? Aren't you throwing stuff down to the bottom of the ocean where it might make this hydrogen sulfide, especially since um, there are other reasons for thinking that the ocean is becoming similar to the condition it was in before the Permian extinction. So we might be headed in exactly the same direction. So instead of just uh, having the, the bounty and the beauty of having this stuff sequestered out of the atmosphere, which is what we want, uh, you is there a possibility that the seaweed going to the bottom is going to be a bad thing? Well, I understand the nature of the concern, Meta. Um, the actuality is that there's a, in, a a large flux of oxygen into the deep ocean, and it's via two sources. One is the uh, Southern Ocean produces Antarctic bottom water, which provides enough oxygen flux each year in the Southern Atlantic, Southern Pacific, and Indian Oceans to um, fix, if you will, or oxidize approximately five gigatons of carbon dioxide. Similarly, the Labrador current in the Atlantic provides enough oxygen with the North Atlantic deep water to provide up to around five gigatons per year of carbon um, fixation in the form of carbon dioxide in, in abyssal waters as well. So there's this huge flux of carbon dioxide. And I think it's important to understand the pre-industrial state where we had five to 20% um, less stratification and um, and 20 to 30% more productivity in subtropical oceans pre-industrially than we do today. And so in many ways, the global warming has been shutting down the primary production of the oceans by double digit percentages. And getting back to a pre-industrial state of normal ocean productivity will help restore and provide enough food for benthic habitats for those organisms to survive. So literally the uh, benthic organisms in the uh, abyssal oceans in the subtropical regions have been on a bit of a starvation diet in the sense that there's far less marine snow now than there was previously due to these mostly empty oceans. So I think it's important to understand where we came from pre-industrially a century ago, if that makes okay, sense. Okay, but now let's talk about this business of ocean stratification and when upwellings because what what you're doing, uh, an essential ingredient of these platforms that you use for uh, for seaweed farms, is that you are new, you are fi- feeding them by pumping water up from the bottom of the ocean uh, because there are nutrients down there. You bring it up, and that feeds the seaweed, and which is it? No. It's not the bottom of the ocean. It's only 100 to 500 meters below the surface. That's like the top 10% of the ocean. So in a, in a real sense, those nutrients are available f- 
from the middle zones, the, the ocean conveyor gradually creates the, it creates the Antarctic bottom water that eventually works its way up. And, and, and it's a giant conveyor belt that takes around 4,000 years. But effectively, by restoring natural upwelling, we can restore the ecosystem function of these kelp forests and plankton forests and get nature back on track to where she was pre-industrially. And that's really the challenge and the opportunity is to restore the natural upwelling that occurred a century or two ago, but has been curtailed by global warming. Okay, now what, uh, help me with this. How are you <laughs> going to restore the upwelling? I, I, I never heard the word upwelling until uh, I heard you use it. And I okay. looked it up, but I don't understand it yet. Uh, what? Uh, how many places are there in the ocean where there's upwelling? And there's also something called downwelling. I didn't know about that. So what's that all about? And uh, uh, and it sounds to me like that is what you want to do to prevent the stratification of the ocean. You don't want stratification of the ocean, right? Uh, no, you'd like to have natural overturning circulation and you'd like to have uh, natural upwelling to continue. Pre-industrially, an offshore wind like the Santa Ana winds off California would blow the warm water offshore and deep cool water would come up from underneath and uh, provide the uh, nutrients that are needed for kelp forests up and down the California coast, for example. Now, in a warmer world, the thermocline is deeper and this light blue water is warmer. That creates an energy barrier to upwelling. So the same amount of wind shear is not enough to actually upwell to the surface. And a result is a partial or complete failure of the upwelling means a loss of those nutrients that can actually produce the kelp forests and produce the oxygen that these fish need to survive. So, so with, that's why uh, you got pumps that are for each platform, you've got something pumping up the nutrients as if right. it were an upwelling. But you want to restore the natural upwelling. How do you how do you intend to do that? I don't get that either. Well, we have uh, marine solar energy, wind and wave energy that can actually uh, effectively restore that upwelling in the case of upwelling pumps. Or with deep cycling, we bring the nutrients, uh, or the seaweed down to the nutrients and, and then back up again. And so this is a very simple mechanism to use renewable energy to restore the natural upwelling that existed pre-industrially using marine solar, wave, and wind energy. Okay, so it's not really natural. I mean, uh, it's you, you've got a machine doing it. We're restoring the ecosystem service. The upwelling was natural, and we're restoring it. Okay. Well, I'm not objecting to your doing it. I just want to know <laughs> how it works. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. it's it's uh, it's effectively, you know, the important thing is to understand that upwelling is natural. And by restoring that function, we can regenerate and restore the kelp forest ecosystem services offshore. Okay, now let's say that you, um, I like to think in terms of proportions because I my, my arithmetic is very weak. And uh, I, I'm just trying to imagine if you, succeed in doing uh really boosting uh all of this production uh increasing the production of of seaweed uh, globally how much of the world's uh, global warming problem could you solve well we're estimating first of all um we've got we've lost 3000 square kilometers of kelp forests and untold square kilometers of plankton forests so getting back to the pre-industrial level, that's the first 3,000 square kilometers. So just getting back to a pre-industrial state with our kelp forest will be a great initial goal. We're estimating that by tripling the area under deep water irrigation each year, for the next dozen years, we can reach one gigaton of carbon fixation. And that will represent a great opportunity to provide a climate wedge because that one gigaton of carbon dioxide fixation represents a, uh, a climate wedge that we can use to not only accelerate our um, reaching net zero emissions, but to actively draw down that carbon as a carbon removal to the abyssal ocean. And that's one reason we're so grateful to be recognized by the X Prize for Carbon Removal Milestone Award as the only uh, awarded nature-based um, solution in the oceans that can ac actually address this while regenerating ecosystems. So it okay, is- Okay, when you say one gigaton, that's a total- over a period of years, it's not a, a gigaton per year. Oh, no. We In the next decade, we expect to be fixing a gigaton of carbon dioxide per year and as, mm -hmm. on an annual basis. Okay. okay, now that, that's good. Now, you say r restoring all these millions of, or a large number anyway, of, of hectares that have vanished, 
uh, you're you're going to do some, but are you hoping that somehow nature will do more uh, now that you've got the, the kick started? <laughs> Um, We'd like to say if you give nature half a chance, she'll rebound with exponential bounty because we've seen it. <laughs> we've seen the thousands of sardines, the hundreds of tuna that have collected under our platforms and, uh, you know, they're voting with their fins and they they know where the good stuff is. So we do believe that uh, there is a multiplicative effect. However, we're building, we're interested in forming a marine permaculture alliance, a global network of coastal communities who are committed to regenerating life in the sea with marine permaculture helping to restore natural upwelling and get these ecosystems back on track. We intend for it to be economically sustainable, that there's a harvest, a sustainable partial harvest of seaweed and fish that is in line with the permaculture design principles that is all about obtaining sustainable yield while regenerating the uh, seaweed forests of the world that can be vital to our survival. Okay, so you need a market to, for this stuff because you're gonna be producing a lot more, or the world anyway, if not just you, other people will be producing a whole lot more seaweed than is being used now. Uh, I am not, I, I like wakami when I go to a Japanese restaurant and I just uh, yesterday sent out for some more. I tell you, you've, you've got me uh, it, busy trying to learn about seaweed. And in fact, I do like wakami, but um, I, I'm not sure that, um, th that I can uh, handle the consumption uh, amount that we're going to need. So we have to get other people eating seaweed and using it for other purposes. Now, here's where my fantasy comes in. My fantasy is I've been for the last two weeks working on a project to list several things that Canada independently could do to uh, to begin to actually have a, a tiny but discernible impact on global warming within five years. Because my sense is that we, uh, people talk about 50 years. And when you, when I hear somebody talk about a 50 year project, I just, I just shrug because that's too long. If you can show me something that we could do that would begin to have a discernible impact within five years, I would be interested. So I started making a list. And partly uh, what what it uh, involves is uh, taking uh, anything that I can that will uh, absorb carbon and hold it for a very, very long time uh, and and uh, improving uh, and, and being able to use it. So I'm thinking of rock dust because uh, rock dust will absorb CO2. So you sprinkle rock dust all over the soil you absorb a lot of CO2. And we're talking on the order of magnitude that you're talking about with, with your seaweed project. There's also biochar. And um, I, I think in terms of cutting down all those red dead trees out in the Rockies that have been killed by the pine beetle and making them into biochar. And if we did that on, on a big scale, then the biochar is the wonderful thing about it is it will retain carbon for thousands of years or so. And so we really get, we would suck out of a lot of uh, the atmosphere and put it in biochar and, and do something, you know, put it on our, on our, um, on our fields, you know, use it as fertilizer or it's not fertilizer, but it, it, it improves the soil in many ways. Same as rock dust. So here we're going to kill two birds with one stone or kill two fish with one uh, hook. Um, uh, by um, by um, uh, 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 not only taking uh, uh, CO2 out of the air, but creating something that we can put on the soil that will improve the production of food for the world, which is another one of the big problems uh, facing is the potential for famine. So then my third thing that I wanted to do to improve the soil that would also be a, a, a way of removing CO2 from the atmosphere was to improve the amount of, or increase the amount of seaweed that is grown in Canadian waters, and then take the seaweed and put it on, on the soil or in the soil. Also, it turns out seaweed is an extremely excellent fertilizer. And I found not only that the problem with the other two things, the rock uh, dust and the 
the biochar is that neither one of them is really a fertilizer because they don't have enough nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium to do the job. They do wonderful things. They put various kinds of uh, the, the rock dust puts minerals that we need and the and the and the biochar makes uh, everything stick and hang around long enough to be useful. But they don't actually add fertilizer and I want to find a way of getting rid of this fertilizer that's causing so much trouble. So it turns out that that, by, that uh, uh, seaweed is a wonderful thing to mix in with the biochar and the rock dust. And, and it would then add the, ner- the uh, nutrients like uh, uh, nitrogen and, and phosphorus and potassium, which are the components of, of, um, uh, of, uh, of fertilizer. So then you'd have a, a real a well-balanced component of things that you can put on the soil. Now, the, the advantage of, of um, the first two elements that I've talked about, the rock dust uh, and the uh, biochar, is that both of them are permanent or virtually for all practical purposes. They're, they lock so- uh, the carbon away permanently forever uh, or virtually forever. But that's not true of the seaweed. If we mix in seaweed with these other two ingredients, our uh, component would still have something in it that is going to go back into the atmosphere. Eventually, the seaweed would uh, would uh, break down, and the CO two would go back in the atmosphere. So it's a it's a delaying mechanism, it, like a tree is a, a great way of holding uh, uh, holding carbon as long as it's alive. But if it rots, falls over and rots, it goes right back in the atmosphere. So then I thought, well, why don't we make uh, biochar out of the seaweed? And, and mix it in, and it, I looked it up, and sure enough, it retains, uh, when you make the seaweed out of the biochar, it, may, it retains the nitrogen and, and other things. So you could go ahead and make your seaweed into biochar and mix it in with the tree bio, bio, um, biochar and the rock uh, dust, and you'd have a, a pretty, you know, a reasonable, uh, a balanced uh, diet for uh, improving the quality of Canadian soil. So far, am I right? Uh, no, but uh, I can explain <laughs> why. And, and you're not far from a good solution. Uh, okay. But we, we did a pu- published a paper uh, with uh, Cornell University on biochar and its ability to what happens to the nitrate. And sadly, most of the nitrate um, gets uh, burned off in pyrolysis. Um, with the with that with the char when the char is formed, so it it is char is useful as a soil amendment, and, and there are certainly some good good beginnings there. Uh, but the highest value for seaweed ends up being to have a liquid biostimulant that can be applied at very modest rates. There are you know a certain amount of nitrate and phosphate that seaweed does have, um, but I think primarily the great thing about the um, biostimulants uh, and the seaweed foliar biostimulants. Are that these uh, liquids have the um, the 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 nitrate utilizer multipliers, and that effectively we um, we spray these biostimulants onto the leaves of the plants in the morning. They go into the stomata while the stomata is open. They upregulate the gene expression of those plants during growth, and that improves the uptake efficiency of nitrate and phosphate and potassium and other micronutrients into the plant to the point where the plant needs twenty percent less fertilizer in the soil to have the, the same productivity. So it's a it's a 1.2 multiplier, if you will, um, of, of nitrate, which is a great start because right now more than 1% of all energy production in the world goes into nitrate fertilizer. So as a result, that's a great uh, way of multiplying the natural nitrate that can be produced by nitrogen fixing microbes in the soil and the phosphate that can be unlocked by fungi that it can actually turn inorganic phosphate into bioavailable phosphate through their enzyme production. Now, the other key part of this is at the same time we're using most of the seaweed for this biostimulant, most of the carbon remains in the solid seaweed components that can actually fall as residual seaweed to the uh, 1,000 meters a day to the abyssal seafloor, where it remains for more than 500 years and you know, in 500 years, China runs out of coal for a billion people. So even in a worst case scenario, um, not suggesting we should burn coal for that long, but in a worst case scenario, um, we'll have a completely different set of challenges in 500 years time. So kicking the can down the road at least 100 years is what the United Nations has said that qualifies for a carbon credit. So 100 to 500 year timescales are highly useful and we can document the century timescales that are available in the abyssal ocean to sink carbon 
and provide a um, a true blue carbon sink that will last for centuries. Okay, now if I I write a, a letter to uh, Justin Trudeau and says, "Here's what I want you to do, and we're going to get it actually functioning within five years and have some show results by five years from now." Uh, I'm going to tell him to sprinkle rock uh, to tell uh, you know incentivize the production of rock uh, dust and uh, biochar from trees and um, Amazon cardboard boxes and uh, and turkey feathers or whatever and uh, and use that to improve the soil. However, that is not going to do away with the need for fertilizer, is it? Looks like uh, these things are not going to. I w- I'm tr- trying to figure a way to abolish fertilizer because the stuff. On the one hand, it's we uh, at least half of the people in the world are alive because they're eating food that's produced by fertilizers, and they wouldn't be here if 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 the fertilizer didn't exist. But on the other hand, it's killing us. It's uh, eutrophication and all kinds of other bad things that it's doing. So I want to get rid of the fertilizer. But what you've given me is a good idea for maybe we should sink a lot of uh, of. of uh, uh, seaweed as fast as possible to take it out of the atmosphere and lock it away for 500 years. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, but it doesn't solve my problem of how to balance the fact that my rock dust and my biochar aren't going to do the whole trick for the farmers. How we am I going to do that? We need to move from better life through chemistry to regenerative agriculture. And a key piece of that are the seaweed foliar biostimulants that only have a 3% market adoption in North America, 6% adoption in Europe. And, um, you know, it's an opportunity for us to scale by an order of magnitude the uh, multiplier that we can have. Now, regenerative agriculture involves using beneficial soil microbial communities to fix nitrogen in the soils and to unlock the enzymatic production of phosphate, bioavailable phosphate from the fungi, those mycorrhizal mushrooms, if you will, um, those fungi can unlock the mineral phosphate. So you can get replete levels of nitrate and phosphate through regenerative means that does not require continual applications of high levels of NPK fertilizer going forward. So there is a bright future. And I think Professor David Johnson from Chico University has um, pioneered that in California and really demonstrated uh, regenerative capabilities of these soil microbial communities that can be inoculated to soils and regenerate uh, healthy soil microbial communities in the soils. Uh, The seaweed, I take a little seaweed every day, and that helps to regenerate my healthy microbial community in my gut. And uh, look what happened to me. I've been taking seaweed every day, and it actually has transformative effects on digestion and actually restoring immune health. Um, and and actually, I hear improve. it makes you smarter too if you've got Alzheimer's or something. It does. It does with uh, omega three fatty acids, EPA and DHA. So there's some regenerative benefits there, and ultimately, uh, I think it's about regenerative agriculture on land, regenerative mariculture in the sea, of which mar- marine permaculture is part, and really identifying those uh, eco, I'd say, circular ecologies that enable the retention of nutrients in the soils and it has to do with multi-trophic and multi-species uh, approaches and that's what permaculture is all about is humanity's sustainable relationship with the forests and that is moving our relationship with the seas from one of extraction in previous decades and centuries to one of regeneration and that's what marine permaculture promises okay now you you mentioned this david johnson guy is he the one who makes I think he calls it uh, compost tea or something like that, and he 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 pours it on the ground and yes. or into little grooves in the in the soil. Is that is that what compost. is that the compost. guy? You, compost tea is a key ingredient. They're also um, humus itself. You know, there you can develop these inoculants that are tea and more as solid solid as well as uh, liquid constituents. And the development of those inoculants, you can you can apply those inoculants to the soil on a, a very light basis, and that can, in under the right conditions, uh, address it. Now, the challenge is if you put glyphosate on the soil, the glyphosate is a known antimicrobial, and it will kill, like an antibiotic, it will kill a lot of those microbes. So the question is, can we get the glyphosate levels down enough 
to where these soil healthy soil microbial communities can start doing their job, and that is fixing nitrate, unlocking phosphate, providing those nutrients to the plants. The plants in turn provide complex sugars back to those microbes, and they form recalcitrant forms of bioavailable carbon that remains for decades, if not centuries, in the soil. And that's humus. That's that's a significant component of humus in the soil. That is part of the dark earth that we all love to garden in. Okay, now you, I've I've come across this notion of biostimulants, but I really didn't quite unpack it or I couldn't figure it out. Uh, I'm still not quite clear. It's not you're not putting a fertilizer on, or it, what is this stuff? You show a picture here of something called Big Grow. Yes. Uh, that's what, just what's in it one brand well what's in it is um that we have it's an organic seaweed um, extract that's a whole seaweed liquid extract and it provides plant growth regulators that are essential their auxins and cytokines and glibarillins are um what the plants respond to they actually respond to this as an ancient uh cycle and effectively these plant growth regulators do a great job as you know, if you uh, if you use sea salt or um, different products in the U.S., uh, it, it has a significant effect on the way your garden grows. It has a transformative effect on providing micronutrients, yes, but also these uh, key organic compounds that are uh, essential to plants thriving. Okay, can you? Here, here's my fantasy. Can you imagine? Uh, that we would be a, that a, with the best of of, of planning, uh, we could tell Canadian farmers uh, now what we want you to do is take some of this rock dust and mix it with this proportion of biochar from trees and put it on in your soil. And when the plants come up, you spray it with this um, this biostimulant, and that way you will not have to use and you must not use any more fertilizer. And you'll do just fine. Now, can we could we say such a thing? There are risks. Five like years. That. And what I would recommend is to uh, combine the biochar with the compost. It turns out the compost helps to. I mean, the the biochar helps to aerate the compost, and the compost inoculates the char. And it's that combination that actually provides superior results to either biochar or compost by itself. Mm -hmm. And that Hold combination. On now. I'm, I'm lost because we got compost in the in the equation. Compost is not the but the stimulant, or is it this the, the the compost is a bunch of good things which you in in which you include some of the stimulant, or I'm sorry, but where does the compost but, come from? Well, compost by itself can happen from kitchen waste and even uh cow manure and other other waste. There it's uh, organic uh, material that is. Uh, effectively able to reconstitute the uh, and provide the nitrate, phosphate, and other minerals that are needed. So compost is a key ingredient to all of this. And biochar by itself, uh, you know, needs to have some nutrients associated with it. So you don't want to put raw biochar onto your soil. Uh, it, first of all, it needs to be properly conditioned and it needs to be um, seasoned and weathered. So effectively, you need this balance of Biochar, yes, which provides habitat for micro healthy microbial communities. Uh, the compost provides nutrients and inoculants, uh, and if the biochar helps to improve the porosity. Then a little bit of rock dust can probably help this formula in the right quantities. Uh, applying that, um, and some of the compost can include seaweed solids even in the right quantities and, and managing the salt levels. So then once you've got that in, in your fields, then you grow your plants and you add the seaweed foliar biostimulants, and this comprises a best practice in agriculture. And complementary to that will be uh, the, the growing of the regeneration of kelp forests off, off, offshore Canada, and uh, as well as in the Hudson Bay potentially. So I think that's a great opportunity to regenerate offshore seaweed mariculture at the same time we're regenerating agriculture and increasing the productivity and decreasing the inputs that are needed for agriculture to thrive going forward. Okay, so you can't really expect to use a lot of the product of, uh, if we increase uh, uh, seaweed production in Canadian waters, mm -hmm. uh, off both coasts and say in, in the Arctic as well, or the Hudson Bay, we can't really use a significant amount of that as a, a soil amendment. 
Well, there can be some useful soil amendments there. I think it's a combination of those soil amendments and what we discussed previously, and that is regenerating the living soil. Moving from a philosophy of better life through chemistry, which quite frankly has gotten us into this predicament, to one where we are fostering the regeneration of healthy soil microbial communities mm -hmm. that can produce nitrate, produce phos or organically available phosphate, and provide recalcitrant carbon generation in the soils with uh, lifetimes of decades to centuries. Okay, you just com complicated my equation, that's all. Uh, it makes it a little bit messy to describe what I want to do. What I want to do is say, suck it out of the air and put it in underground in a form that's going to stay there permanently. And not only permanently, but it's going to improve the production of, of the food that, that the world needs. Now, and that you can do all of that within five years. So you've got it a little bit more complicated when it involves the production of these biostimulants, which I don't fully understand, uh, and, and how important are they in this whole? Uh, uh, I guess you've taken you've taken the basically you've taken the seaweed out of my game plan because I can't quite see that much of it is going to go into the soil to um, to feed people. Well, some of it can go into the soil in the sense of it being a soil amendment, but a higher value is probably as food and feed. Uh, in addition, there is there is a fertilizer component to it. And it's something we're working down the value chains. You know, the present products we're developing are thousands of dollars per ton, but those will become, as we increase the production and decrease the cost of seaweed, that will apply more and more to, uh, you know, hundreds of dollars per ton for other fertilizer products. So long-term, I think there is. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of nitrate and plenty of phosphate in the sea. Ultimately, we can use those sources. But keep in mind, the soil microbial communities do a really pretty good job when f under optimal conditions of fixing nitrogen from the air and producing nitrate uh, fertilizer. And then furthermore, the uh, fungi that can unlock the mineral phosphate and and actually convert that into, you know, the, some of that rock dust has mineral phosphate, needs to be converted into bioavailable form. And that's what the fungi do with their enzymes. So there's some great sources of of uh, these nutrients right in the soils, and by fostering healthy soil microbial communities, we can enable that. And the seaweed provides an essential prebiotic function to foster these healthy soil microbial communities. So it is a hybrid um, uh, approach. Uh, you know, as I've learned biology at the Marine Biological Lab and other places, biology is almost always more complicated than we think it is. But in the end, if you can give nature half a chance with a helping hand to help fill some of those nutrient value chain gaps, nature will rebound with exponential bounty. And we're finding that time and time okay. again, ease it, as well it, as- Turn this, turn this this slide thing off. I wanna look at you. Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking um, now how much of this, uh, how much uh, seaweed could we convert into these biostimulants? Uh, how, uh, you know, that doesn't sound like a very big part of the, of the huge amount that you're going to be producing? Well, it's a matter of stages. I mean, there's a well, there's such a limited market penetration right now of only three to 6% that there's order of magnitude more, uh, more biostimulants to produce. And that would likely require thousands of square kilometers, which is exactly the size that we need to get to as a stepping stone towards that gigaton of carbon fixation we're aiming for in the next decade. So how quickly could you start a business of making the biostimulant uh, on scale uh, so that we could say within five years, you could start putting that stuff uh, on, on the soil or on the plants? We're doing it right now in the Philippines, and we're providing this biostimulant to hundreds of hectares of uh, rice crops, which is the initial demand, uh, but it also works on fruit trees and other kinds of flowering crops. And that could start in 12 to 24 months in, in places like Canada, where there's a plenty of opportunity to scale this at hectare scale. So it's literally 12 to 24 months away. And it's something we're looking forward to enabling through the scaling of, um, let's say, the marine permaculture industry uh, over the coming months and years. Okay. Ultimately, what proportion of uh, the world's uh, harvest of seaweed do you think will be devoted to the production of biostimulant? That's a good question on different timescales. You know, initially we think bio, biostimulant is a leading product, but then ultimately uh, people, there's 
you know, 8 billion people on this planet nearly. And I think each of them should be eating uh, 10 grams or more of seaweed each day. So it represents an opportunity. We're really interested in, in having tasty products that are going to be shelf stable and can be transported across the continents and provided, you know, hopefully locally, but, um, you know, local seaweed that is, is transformative as far as health span and cognitive health span, which is absolutely essential because a third of the world with the Alzheimer's gene uh, needs um, a, a healthy source of EPA and DHA that comes from aquatic plants, ultimately. I mean, the, the sardines have a lot of it because they eat the plants, but effectively, whether you eat the seaweed or the sardines, uh, this is essential. I mean, there's 500 million vegetarians in, in, in India, and in India, the US, North America, and Australia have the lowest decile, that's lowest 10% of EPA and DHA in their bloodstream because they don't eat enough fish. So the reality is for cognitive health span, the literature is out there. It's going to become broad, more broadly known that to maximize your cognitive health span, the only animal protein associated with longevity and health span is small fish. So we need to be a lot more vegetarian, a lot more pescatarian, and moving towards healthy lifestyles that will provide us this superfood nutrients that we'll need in order to increase our, our health spans in the years to come. Okay. And now it, I'm still, I'm so hung up on my desire to make seaweed into biochar that I don't want to get all give up so easily. I read that it's good stuff, but you just dashed the idea because you say that the nitrogen is all burned off in the powderizing. But is there any good reason? Can you give me any good rationale for saying that take the bio take take them the seaweed and make it into biochar well in some contexts if there were no higher value use for it um, char could be produced from seaweed there is something called hydrochar which is less permanent than biochar uh, but that could be created more easily in a, in a pressure cooker and uh, at some point you could even generate bio crude that could provide a carbon negative source of jet fuel in the future um, and that's again through pressure cooking you know, just like on your stove, it's just done uh, at high temperature and high pressure. Um, and so, you know, with the right kind of pressure cooking, you can create hard hydrochar and you can create bio crude that could actually give us a carbon negative uh, and climate positive solution to long distance airline travel in the future. Okay. Well, we're not going to be with there. They're within five years. I'm trying to think of any use for it now. There's oh, nothing. there's plenty of uses for it now, food and feed and fertilizer. And we've got millions of acres to uh, provide seaweed foliar biostimulants for. So that's first and foremost. I mean, the wheat crops across Canada. You know, you know, I've, I've heard that the the Hudson <clears throat> Bay is just crawling with seaweed now. It's a bumper crop. They don't know why, except, of course, it's warming. That's clear. But it would be a great uh, 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 employment opportunity for the Inuit people living on the shores if if they could harvest the stuff. And I was thinking, well, you know, you could take a, a dumpster and, and drill a hole in the bottom, a little one, and then make a, a really snug fitting lid so that the smoke can, can't get out and the oxygen can't get in. And that would make a, a perfect, that would make a perfect um, uh, a pyrolyzer. And you could take that anywhere you go easily you know that even your garbage trucks can lift them and move them around and so you could go anytime you have dead trees even there's this emerald bo ash borer that's killing all the trees in toronto we could cut them down and make you know right there make make biochar but the people we could do it up in 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 churchill manitoba and we could put them on the train because they have a, tra a freight train that goes from Churchill to Thompson, Manitoba. And you'd have an industry for people in in Hudson Bay area making biochar. But you say there's oh. no use for it. Um, what I would suggest to start with is definitely develop, develop the biostimulants, and we'd be happy to help with that. But then secondly... Uh, the first use for that the seaweed solids would be to develop um, healthier compost. We don't have enough compost in the world. And effectively, by facilitating that compost approach, if not food, feed, and fertilizer markets themselves, that would enable um, <clears throat> the um, provision of the nitrate and phosphate pretty directly. And I would suggest that the best way to look at really sinking the carbon would be off the coasts of Canada, where you can go to deep water and 300 or 1,000 meters or, or deeper, that actually provides uh, a potential 
to sink carbon for centuries. At the same time, we're producing these critical products that are needed for global food security for humanity, as well as ecosystem regeneration. But you don't get paid for the, the <laughs> seaweed that goes to the bottom of the ocean. That's, oh, I think you know, huh? yeah, there's voluntary, voluntary carbon credits already for that. Uh, and um, I think as we go forward, we'll be able to refine the methodologies. I'm part of a work um, a, a workshop of 50 uh, scientists from around the world working with Ocean Visions on a seaweed sinking workshop to really identify the appropriate scales and the appropriate opportunities to sink seaweed sustainably as a net carbon export. So that's actively being researched. And it's um, it's something that we need to raise more funding for and really demonstrate how well it works. And I think we'll be able to, with these hectare scale maricultures, inviting marine ecologists and climate scientists alike to demonstrate the ecosystem regeneration and the carbon removal of uh, marine-based uh, permaculture that can actually help to regenerate life on the planet at the same time we're feeding humanity. Well, I, I I like the idea, but I can't see it as much of a promising business unless, of course, somebody can pay you to do it by taxes. But but what I'm thinking of is, you know, it, other things that you talk about could be things you could make money from. Somebody could make a living. You do, you know, if people eat the food, eat seaweed, then you sell it to them and, and you get your money from being a farmer or producing food. And, and the same with if you use it if, as fertilizer, you get money for it. So it's an industry. But I don't see, I mean, it's, it, I, it, it does the world more good when it sinks to the bottom of the ocean because it's taking carbon out. But uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not either or. It's not either or. We're growing the food yeah. and a quarter of the seaweed falls off the platforms during growth and sinks a thousand meters a day to the abyssal seafloor where it remains for centuries. And so it really is yes and. We're generating food security. The seaweed falls off. We can monitor how much is falling off. And that provides a carbon export. It's true. Most of the revenues are coming from food security. But if we don't um, feed the world, we're going to have uh, food riots and water wars. And if we don't um, help to regenerate our ecosystems, we could get to zero carbon. But if it's on a dead planet, we'll really, really have succeeded. And so the opportunity is we have a triple bottom line with marine permaculture at the Climate Foundation, and that is ensure food security for billions of people who depend on the seas for their livelihoods and for their sustenance to regenerate those ecosystems that keep our life support systems alive on the planet and to measure the carbon export of these regenerative interventions, which can ultimately scale to the gigaton scale. So we see that triple bottom line as being essential to everything that we do. Okay, quick. The, the the last question, then I'll come back to trying to fantasize about this biostimulant, which I don't understand very well. How how big a thing could you make that into? It is you know how to make it? Is it is it hard to do? Could you have? Could we have people uh, at Hudson Bay make it and then sell it? I think potentially yes. I mean, the source a source of seaweeds is um, an essential part of it, and uh, we're refining the the approaches. In fact, we're building biorefineries that can produce uh, biostimulant and food and feed products concurrently from a single stream of seaweed. So that is something we're actively engaged on, and those transportable biorefineries will be an essential part of enabling enabling coastal communities from the Hudson Bay to BC to uh, you know the the eastern shores of Nova Scotia. Uh, and and uh, and further north to uh, be able to thrive in the future. So we see this as a key opportunity to build high value products that are produced locally and can be used globally. Okay, well, you've you've done a lot. To do. <laughs> I have to I have to think some more, and I have to find out more about biostimulants. Um, but uh, my pleasure. Uh, it's great to uh, get, have all these wonderful, uh, inspiring questions. Um, the future is here today. It's just not broadly distributed yet. And I'll be happy <laughs> to uh, talk further with you about uh, how biostimulants work and how a lot of these regenerative practices can involve moving, let's say, permaculture design practice from agriculture on land to marine permaculture in the sea and ultimately to the social permaculture that can evolve um, better practices of how we get along together and how we evolve these solutions together as a, as a species. Okay, it's been fun and uh, very worthwhile. So I really appreciate it. So take Thank care. You, we'll Matt. be back in touch. Okay. Fine. Bye. Bye. Project Save the World produces one of these shows three days a week and sometimes more. This is episode 493. 
You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website, to save the world.ca. Eventually, we even post the transcripts there. And when you get to the website, look around. We have conversations there about six global issues, plus potential reforms in governance, economics, and civil society. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar, or the name of one of the guest speakers. And after you've watched or listened, scroll down and share your thoughts about the show. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can buy a single copy or subscribe for $20 Canadian per year through Press Reader. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar enter the word Peace. You'll see the cover of the current issue and buttons to click to subscribe.